Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. In this video, I'm going to be doing a load takedown on a new two-story extension to an existing residential house. This is going to be slightly more complicated than the first load takedown video I did, but I'm hoping it should all make sense. This little project right here might be a really great opportunity for me to make a little mini series on how I sort of go about designing and scheming a residential home extension. So before I actually do the numbers on the load takedown, I need to work out what kind of structure is going to be involved in this house extension. So I'm going to be working from top down, but alternatively you could work from the bottom up, it's actually up to you. So the first thing I've noticed is that there is a ridge beam which I need to spec. There are a couple of giveaways which tells me that it needs a ridge beam and it's not going to be a roof truss. The first being there's a roof light, and the second is, well, the architect has kind of indicated that there is going to be a ridge beam. The architect has indicated to me that the ridge beam is going to be sat on an internal wall and they've shown this by a dash line and it's going to be a lot clearer when I go on to the first floor plan. So now that I've moved on to the first floor plan I can quite clearly see which wall is going to be supporting the ridge and I'm going to highlight it green to make it really really clear for me that it's going to be a load bearing wall. Okay, so now that we've identified that there's a load bearing wall on the first floor supporting the roof ridge beam, the next thing I want to do is to check if that wall continues down onto the ground floor. So now that we're on the ground floor, we can quite clearly see that that wall does not continue all the way down to the ground floor and the architect has indicated a new RSJ. So I'm going to be indicating this new beam as a red dash line. So now that we've drawn this beam in, we can quite clearly see that one end of the beam is supported on the external wall and the other end needs to be supported on another beam spanning in the perpendicular direction. So again, I'm going to be marking this new beam in a dashed red line. To make things clear and to make sure that I don't forget what beams are doing and what they're supporting, I make sure I add some notes and some annotations next to them. Generally, if a beam is supporting another beam, I'd like to call these a transfer beam. And by labeling it a transfer beam, I'm kind of making sure that I don't forget that a transfer beam has different deflection requirements compared to a standard steel beam design. The architect has actually marked on a RSJ within the dining and family room. And we can kind of deduce that because there's a beam here, we can assume that the floor joists are spanning onto it. Okay, so now that we've worked out the key structures and we can quite clearly see a load path, we can start labeling up the structure to kind of create a sequence of works of what we're going to be calculating. Because it's a load takedown, we want to work from the top down. So the first thing that we want to be calculating is the end reactions for the roof ridge beam. Secondly, because the point load or the end reaction from the beam is bearing onto a wall, the reaction force from the ridge beam is going to spread uniformly along the length of the wall. Next we'll need to calculate the end reactions of the steel beam carrying the low bearing wall. I forget to indicate the span direction of the first floor joists in the new extension and they're going to be spanning parallel to our new beam so that means there's going to be no applied load from the floor. Fourth step will be to calculate the end reactions of the existing steel beam. And the fifth and final step of this load takedown is to calculate the end reactions of our new steel transfer beam. Now let's define our loading. I would normally break the individual loads down, but to save time I'm just going to give you the total load. I do a breakdown of the loads of typical wall and floor loadings in my first load takedown video, so go check it out if you haven't seen it. So first we have the dead weight of the roof, and that's going to be 1.1 kN per meter squared. Then on the first floor we have a lightweight timber floor, and that's at 0.7 kN per meter squared. Then we have the internal blockwork wall, which is supporting our ridge beam. 
with a load of 2 kilonewtons per meter squared. We also have an existing wall which is being supported by our new steel transfer beam and this will have a load of 5.5 kilonewtons per meter squared. Now moving on to the imposed loads. We have the roof load with minimal access other than for maintenance so we can apply a 0.6 kilonewtons per meter squared load. Then for a typical residential house with lightweight partitions it's going to come to 2.5 kilonewtons per meter squared. So to calculate the end reaction of the ridge beam we're first going to need to know what the beam length span is and also what the tributary length of the timber rafters are spanning. I know that this drawing is scaled to 1 to 50 so using concepts app on the iPad I can just change the scale and then I can scale accordingly. So I work out that the ridge beam span is 6.4 meters and the length of the rafter is 2.3 meters on both sides. I round up slightly because the measurement is on plan and in reality it's going to be on a pitch so the length is going to be slightly higher but it's not going to make too much of a difference. So now that we've got the beam span and also the trib length, we can now calculate the end reactions of our ridge beam. I'll be keeping the dead and the live loads separate because I can use these to design the beams later. I always find it useful to keep them separate whilst I'm doing the load takedown and then combine them and factor them up accordingly when it's time to do the design. Okay, so we're going to assume that the loading is going to be a full UDL. So all we're going to do is take the dead load of the roof, multiply it by the trib length, and then multiply it by the beam span over two. And this gives us a dead load end reaction of 8.1 kilonewtons. We repeat the same process for the live load. So just to help me visualize the problem, I'm just gonna draw a very quick sketch section. So looking at the dimensions and the position of the ridge beam, you can see that the ridge beam is just away from the door opening. A reasonable assumption would be that the wall would be around 2.7 meters tall and the reaction force from the ridge beam can assume to be spread at a 45 degree angle. So with this in mind we know that the load is going to spread 2.7 meters on either side of the beam. For simplicity and for the purposes of a load takedown, we can kind of forget or ignore the door opening. The load is still going to spread and it is still going to be factored in into the end reaction of the beam. So having just scaled the drawing and taken a measurement, we can tell that the beam is around 3 meters long. So because the beam length is so short, we can safely assume that the load is going to spread fully along the entire length of the beam. So I've just been amending the sketch as I go along, taking in account of these new measurements. In my opinion this is fairly conservative and you could go into the nth degree to work out the end reactions of the walls and to work out how much load the lintel is going to be spread at the end but because the door opening is so small it's really not worth the time to do it but if you wanted to feel free to go ahead So now that we know that the ridge beam end reactions can be spread across the entire length of the beam, all we need to do is divide the end reactions by the full length of the wall, which is 3 meters. So then we get a dead load UDL of 2.7 kilonewtons per meter, and we just repeat the same process for the live load. Okay, so now we need to add on the self weight of the wall. And this will just be the density of the wall, 2 kilonewtons per meter squared, multiplied by the height, which was 2.7 meters. A small mistake which I just noticed is that I forgot to add on the roof loads. So if you're doing this, remember to go back and check where the roof is spanning. Because the self weight of the wall is a dead load, we can add it on to the ridge beam dead load to give us a total dead load of 8.1 kilonewtons per meter. Okay, so next we're working out the end reactions of the steel beam, which is supporting that masonry wall. 
So just like calculating the end reactions for the ridge beam, because it's all a UDL, it's very simply just the dead load multiplied by the span over two. And again, we repeat it for the live load. Okay, so the fourth step was to work out the end reactions of the existing beam. So we're gonna to need to scale and measure the length of the existing beam and also work out what the trib length or the trib area of the existing floor span is. So now that we've worked out the existing joist span and the trib length, we can now calculate the dead and the live end reactions. So it's quite simply the floor load times by the trib length times by the span over two. And then we repeat again for the live load. Okay, so finally working out the loads on our new steel transfer beam. So the first thing to do is just to write down what the end reactions of the incoming beams are. So we know that we've got a beam three and a beam four, so let's just write out the dead and the live loads for both. Next, we know that the new first floor extension is actually spanning onto the new steel transfer beam. So we need to work out the loads from the floor. So we scale and measure the drawing and we find that the trib length is gonna be 3.4 over two, so it's 1.7 meters. Then we can work out the UDL load for the dead and the live load. So that's the floor density multiplied by the trib length. Next, we need to remember that the steel transfer beam is also supporting the existing masonry. So let's just assume that the masonry height is 5.5 meters. So the self weight of the masonry is going to be the density 5.5 kilonewtons per meter squared multiplied by the height, which is also 5.5 meters. Now we can sum up the UDL dead loads. Because the two incoming beams are positioned slightly differently, it's important that we measure to work out the exact location of where the beams are, as this has an effect on the reaction forces. So once we've scaled and measured, we can draw our 2D frame diagram and then we can mark out the positions of the point loads with accurate dimensions. So now that we've calculated all the loads which are acting on the beam, now we can work out the end reactions of our new steel transfer beam. So first, looking at the end reactions from beam 3, so you take the point load 12.2 kN multiplied by 1.8 meters divided by the total length, which is 4.5 meters. Do this with the live load end reaction from beam 3. To save a bit of time, I'm just going to be writing out the calculations I'm going to do and then calculating them all once at the end. So similar to beam 3, but working out the end reactions from beam 4, you're multiplying by 1.5 meters instead of 1.8 meters. Again, do the same for the live load. Then just type it all into your calculator to work out the end reaction at point A from the beams three and four. Now we need to work out the end reaction from the UDL loads, which is from the floor loads and the wall loads. So just like calculating the end reaction, say from like we did earlier from the ridge beam, it's just the UDL times the beam length over two. Now we've worked out all the end reactions at point A, all we need to do is just sum them up. So I'll still sum them up as dead and live before giving an actual total load of the dead and live combined.
For now we need to work out reaction at point B. And this is going to be pretty much exactly the same sort of steps. The only difference is when you're multiplying the point load, you're multiplying it by the other dimension. So in this case, we'll be multiplying by three meters and then dividing again by the total length of the beam. Keep working your way through until you've calculated all the end reactions from the point loads. I won't speed up this bit just to make sure that people can follow, but if you want to, feel free to skip ahead. The reactions from the UDL load is going to be exactly the same as what we calculated before. Then we do the same thing and sum up all the loads again. And there you have it, that's a load takedown from top to bottom. And basically from these loads you can start calculating or designing the beams. We can start designing the pad stones or checking the masonry panels or the masonry columns or the piers and then you can also start checking the foundation loads. I haven't decided what the next part will be but please remember to like and subscribe and smash the notification bell to make sure you're notified for when I release the next part of this video. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you next time. Cheers.